I think it's relative, isn't it? You know, I mean, we, I think one reason why we don't say that a baby is aging is because we're a lot older than the baby. But I remember when my grandson, who's now six, was about two, and a four-year-old would come in the room and my daughter would say, wow, he's a big kid. You know, so we, we are drawing attention to sort of where people are, I think, from the beginning, which is that acknowledgement of maybe more experience or longevity or whatever. And then about, about midlife, you know, you, you start to have a little relativity shifts and then shifts again. Yeah, it's, it's really fascinating to me how we have decided that uh, most of the physical changes up to around age 30, we see as very positive, like, um, but then there's something that happens from mid thirties on that we start identifying the physical changes that we have as negative. And um, I, I just wonder if, if that's pervasive in every kind of culture. I, I suspect it's not in some uh, cultures, which are more I, community. I think it's even more pervasive in certain ways because I can remember, I don't know how many, this is a function of aging. I don't remember how many decades ago it was that I had a client who came to me in her 20s and said, I know I'm already past my peak. And I, was, I, I mean, that was that. And there was, I mean, it wasn't that she was neurologically impaired in any way. She was basically a normal person who had some pain, right? And past her peak. And so I think that there is, I think a lot of times it comes from how we grew up, what our expectations were when we were younger what we saw happening around us. You know, I mean, I, I saw, I, I grew up actually in a restaurant and I worked in the check room, the coat check room um, during high school. And what that entailed was taking people's coats and then doing my homework for two hours while they did their thing and then giving them their coats back, right? And we had a group that meant that was called the golden agers and you had to be 50 to get into that group. And I remember looking at those people as a teenager thinking, oh my God, they're almost dead. Right. And they, a lot of them appeared almost dead because we told people that they should be almost dead at that age. And if you, if you decide you're going to comply, you just get dead at 50. Yeah. I mean, I do think a lot of it has to do with how we keep, we keep moving and calling ourselves to awareness. That's what I notice in a lot of people. What do you think, Mary Beth? The, the quotation from Moshe Feldenkrais that kept coming to me through all of these talks was, we act in accordance with our self-image. And uh, that has been so uh, such a guiding light for me in the work. One of the things I first noticed when I entered my practitioner training, uh, my, my oldest living relative was still alive then, my Aunt Bess. Uh, she was the last of the Mohicans. She lived to be 106 years old. Wow. And she really had all of her marbles until about the last two years. And she maintained an intense interest in everybody and everything around her. She, she had been a pastor's wife. So she was used to, you know, sending cards to people. And this really provided a lot of structure for her life. And I remember thinking in my Feldenkrais class uh, training, you know, I, I potentially have the genes to, uh, to be sticking around here for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I had this moment of awareness where I thought, I would love to be just really old, but I don't want to feel old. And I saw pretty clearly that this Feldenkrais work was going to be my, my ticket to, uh, to opening up those possibilities for myself. 